patients in your guest lecture on Wednesday. I think it's oftentimes nice to get a little bit different perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope you enjoyed Dr. Ron's lecture. I think you guys did prove to him that we do know our hat in this lecture. Um, we did that pretty hard. Any questions before we start? Everyone registered? One person left, and then if you haven't registered, go ahead and use the app clicker. We will um, we'll get the remember things in the text and afterwards the grading. So if you've got it, go ahead and use it. Um, any questions before we start? None at all. I'll ask you a few questions. What's the SI unit of charge? Coulombs. Coulombs, good. Um, so if we have a charge and we want to an object and we think it might be charged and it's attracted to a positive charge, can we conclude that it's negatively charged? No. No, it could be neutral. neutral. If we wanted to be certain that it was negatively charged, what, what test would make it certain? Is it repelled by negative charges? One person. <laughs> it was good. But it repel another negative charge. Perfect. Uh, well, any question about the electroscope? I'll ask you a question about electroscope. Are you ready? All right, electric field. If I have an um, electric field and it's pointing from your left to the right, so if I have a test charge, positive test charge, the force will be what direction? Let's, let's say the field is pointing from your left to the right. I put a positively charged test charge here. What direction will the force be? Negative. 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 And we find the field, what, what direction would that field vector be at the point, that point there? <coughs> to the left. Let's put another positive charge here. Let's call this big Q, call this little Q. Uh, how would we find the force on the little Q to the big Q? <coughs> Find this distance here, couldn't we? That'd be R. We know R hat is the vector, unit vector in that direction. We can find R, we know K, we know Q. We can say our force then um, on little Q equal to K times Q times. I'm going to leave a blank here. R hat divided by R squared times little q. Okay, if k is positive, q is positive, little q is positive, R hat is to the right. So this will all be positive times R hat. So if q is positive, force will be in the R hat direction. Now, we can separate this and say the force on little q is equal to the electric field at the point that little q is at times q, or we can say q times e. So if q is in the positive direct, is a positive charge, the force will be in the same direction as e. Now what if we replace this little q and made it negative now? Now what direction is the force? Well, Q is positive, little Q is negative, right? So this force will now be in the opposite of R hat. Same thing up here. Now that Q is negative, the force on this negative little Q will be in the opposite direction as So, imagine an electric 
electric field, and it's from the left side of the room towards the right side of the room. If I put a positive charge here, which direction will the force be on it? It'll be to your right. If I put a negative charge here, which direction will the force be on that charge down there? It'll be to your left. So we can think of if there's an electric field from the left of the room to the right of the room, we can envision that maybe there's a bunch of positive charges over here, a bunch of negative charges over there. Wouldn't that set up a field that all these points in space between them would be from the left to the right? Can you visualize that? So now instead of gravity pointing down, we have this electric field pointing to the right. If we put a positively charged charge here, which direction will the force be? repelled from the positive, it's attracted to the negative, it's in the direction of the electric field. However, if I put a negatively charged object in, in this field, which direction is the force? It's the opposite direction. Right? So this is kind of a little bit different than gravity. Gravity, no matter what, we put an object with mass, we let go, and it falls down. If we have a charged object now in this electric field that we're envisioning, it could fall to the left or it could fall to the right depending on whether the remote is positively charged or negatively charged. That's a little bit different from gravity. But any questions about that? All right, there is a problem in your textbook. It gives you the some information about charges, the distance between them. I think the force is one newton. Um, we could figure out information about the charges. But all it asks is if we increase this distance, say we make the distance twice as big, what will happen to the force between those two objects? It will be decreased by how much? If you double r, r squared increases by 4, the force will be 1 fourth as big. You don't have to do a whole lot of math. If it's three times as far apart, what happens to the force? Make sense? Right, let's get our clickers out. Okay. The bad news is I uh, we're gonna have have a bunch of clicker test quizzes that I haven't been able to give you because of slow. The good news is we have lots of time to practice. To be definite, we have to see it repelled. Just because it's attracted to the positive, that doesn't, it could be neutral. So, to determine it, B, we alone, we don't need A. A really is not conclusive.
So the electric field points up to see, the positive test charge is at A, and the force at point A points up. So since it's a positive charge, which direction must the electric field also point at A? Up. So now if we take that positive charge away, we put it, which way direction is the field at point A? Does it, the charge itself we do, it doesn't create a field on itself, so we, when we have a charge of interest, we're not considering the field created by that charge of interest. Or there's some source charge that's creating it. So that field's still there. Now we put a negatively charged object at point A. The electric field still points up, but the force on that negative charge would be in the opposite direction. Negative Q times E is now down.
So how do we do this? This is, if we double the charge on one side, or we double the charge, what will that do to the field strength? If we double the distance, what does that do to the field strength? So the closest together and highest charge is um, two. Then we go to one, so this would be half as strong. Then we go to four. four. Well, we've doubled the distance, so that gives us one half, fourth the strength, but we've doubled the charge, so it's half the field strength. And then here we haven't changed the charge, but we've doubled the distance, so we've got one fourth the field strength. So the answer would be two, one, four, three. D. Two, one, four, three. Determine if you have a glass charge you need. Okay. We're gonna, yes. We're get 100 percent on this one. Come on now. Let's go, Let's go, Bob. And everyone's answer. Well, we gained like three. We gained a person. We did gain a person. Why do you guys like some eye clickers register more than once? No, we actually gained a person. All right. There we go. All right, so if that shows up on the test, that would be a good thing. One other thing I want to do before we get to the I think this problem here caused a lot of people some angst. Oh, is it this? Actually, is this problem or the one before it? So in my case, the vector was 55 degrees to the left of the vertical. I kept messing up on my little stick on if I select my axes to be horizontal and vertical, most of you have no problem. The second part is the one that causes the trouble. What if I don't define my axes to be vertical and horizontal? What if I shift them by 30 degrees? Does vector B move? No. So if we now let X be up in this direction, I let Y be up in that direction, what's the angle between Y and B? 25. 25 degrees. Is B in the positive or negative X direction? Negative. Negative. We draw our triangle here. The X component of B will be a negative magnitude of B times the sine of 25 degrees. The Y component magnitude of B times the cosine of 25. So that the point of this was sometimes it's going to be convenient to change our axes for other reasons. We need to be able to do that. Any questions about that problem? Any questions about the other mastery?
what if instead you saw a dipole? Or what if I gave you a rod and I charged it? <coughs> we had now charges over a whole infinite number of points. We take that. We've talked about if there's several points, we can find the field from the first point, we can add it to the second point, we can add it to the field from the third point. What if we distribute the charge uniformly along a, a rod? Or a long wire? What if we put charge on a large plate? We've all done calculus now. Our approach will be very similar to saying a lot of points. So we'll say there's an infinitesimally small charge, and we'll find the field from it. Then we'll find the field from the next infinitesimally small charge. Except there's a very large number of them, so we'll need to integrate over the line or over the plane to find the field. But our process will not change. So let's work through this. We talked about solving Coulomb's law through problems. I think that's slightly different from Knight. Some people have asked, can I use the same method Knight uses? That's fine. This is the way I like to do it. It's really, the, you get the same answer. I like thinking in terms of R hat more. If we're finding the electric field, how would we change what we're doing here? We take away the charge of interest. There would only be source charges that are creating the field. <coughs> what would that do to our units? K hat, or 1 over 4 epsilon naught, has the units newtons meter squared divided by coulomb squared. The meter squared will still be cancel with the meter squared. Now we'll only have one Q at the top. And we'll have Q squared on <coughs> and charge Coulomb squared at the bottom. So our units will then become Newtons per Coulomb. Right? Units. Then when we have Q times Z, that'll be Coulombs times Newtons per Coulomb. So we did talk about, I'm going to assume that we can all find R, R hat, plug in and go. Which direction is R hat in this case? Trying to point of interest here. R is in that direction. R hat will be the fourth quadrant. It will be positive x, negative y. What is what is our hat here? It's one of our It should be negative J, shouldn't it? Our hat is negative J. But the electric field is in what direction? Positive J, because we'll have a negative R hat. Which direction is our hat here? From our source to the point of interest is in the positive x direction, so r hat is equal to i. And what direction is the force? I. It's also in the i because we have a positive charge. 
So if we then combined all three of those, we could add the field from the three previous calculations. If you're not comfortable with this, if you're not comfortable with the math, please see me. I promise these will show up in the homework. They'll show up in the test. I just really want you to be able to do this. It's just So there's different objects we could look at. What do the fields look like around a point charge? If I have a point charge here, what does the field look like as we move away from that point charge? It, it always points away from the point charge, doesn't it? If it's positive, it always points towards it. If the point charge is negative. As we move away, what happens to the magnitude of the field? It's small. <laughs> What about a dipole, or if we have a charged rod? Let's start to think through these. So I know that you started a dipole example. Oops. I'm going to go to something first. All right. Imagine you have a rod that's three meters long, and we have 12 coulombs of charge evenly distributed on it. What does that kind of imply? It implies that rod's probably a conductor. Um, and we assume that that charge is continu continuous, continuously distributed. <coughs> what is the charge for every meter of that rod? The charge, the charge density. And if there's 12 coulombs over 3 meters, then the charge density would be 4 coulombs per meter. If I cut that rod in half now, or a third, so now I have 2 meters of rod, one meter of rod. What's the charge density of this piece? It's four coulombs per meter. What's the charge density down here? Four coulombs per meter. So the charge density is the same for each little piece of that rod, assuming the charge is evenly distributed. So when we cut it into little chunks, now, if we're assuming that the charge is evenly distributed, does that mean the object has to be metal or a conductor? It doesn't have to be, but some. But if it's a conductor, it'll naturally do that. Right. If it's an insulator, then we have to be careful that we distribute that charge e evenly as we produce the charge on that object. So does everyone understand the question? It's a very good question. Is it, does, it, does it have to be a conductor? It doesn't have to be, just that if it's not a conductor, we have to do a lot of work to make sure that the charge is distributed evenly. Okay. The key point I want here is the charge density, as we break this into smaller and smaller pieces, does not change as we break it up, if it's, if it's been evenly distributed. We can have a similar thing with a surface. We can have a half a meter of plate, if we have three nanocoulombs of charge evenly distributed on that plate, we can now talk about the, that's not a linear charge density, it's an area charge density. So scratch that out. We have some amount of charge per unit area. That's it. It should be an eight. I guess let's change it to an eight out there. Too. So to differentiate between linear charge densities and surface, I'll use lambda for a linear charge density. I'll use eta for a surface. I'll use rho for a volume. So you're used to probably, from chemistry, I'm sure you're used to normal densities where you have a mass per 
unit volume. With um, electric statics, we'll use line densities with surface densities. Right. What would be, if I asked you to calculate this, we could calculate R, R hat, we could go through the whole bit. That's good. But there's something that we should notice. What do we know about the distances from those two ch source charges to the point of interest? Same. 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 What do we notice about the magnitude of the two source charges? Same. 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 So if we drew this, sketch this real quickly, and tell me what you can say about the answer. is the field at a point of interest from the top source charge? And from the bottom? And when we add those two together, our resultant will be electric field at this point? Is it up here this direction? Is it that direction or is it that direction? Good. Electric field's in this direction. This is just a component of the electric field. This is another component of it. But the actual field at this point is only one direction. So don't, what I don't want you to think is that there's the electric field at this point is in any more than one direction. Only in one direction at each point but we can find it by adding up the components. All right. If we move far away from these two points, oh, what, what do we notice about this? What happens to the vertical components of the two parts? They cancel. So we can say by symmetry, we don't need to bother to calculate those. Does everyone see that? If I move far away from those two points, what happens to the vertical components? <coughs> they become really, really small, right? In fact, it's just like I add up the electric field, if I get far enough away, of the two charges. So in fact, if I get far enough away, I, I can ignore the fact that those are distinct charges and treat them just as a point charge in the middle, and I'll get about the right answer. Now, if I get really close, say right between them, what's the electric field right there? Zero, right? So that's not a good choice if we're close. A very, very bad choice. But if we get far enough away, these two charges look like just a single charge. We get from the sense of the field. What if we replace the bottom? Sketch this out. Can you please choose a point far enough away? 
way we get to act as though there's no charges. So, uh, get far off here. <laughs> there is a sweet spot. So it's uh, when Y is a base of B0 and the X is still something. And it's, you know, we're kind of thinking big and sound. But very far away if we're talking about common distances. You read a short distance. That's, a, that's actually a good point. What is very far away? Well, very far away means much bigger than this distance S. If this distance S is in microns or angstroms, very far away is a very short distance. It just means a lot farther than the distance. All right, so the electric field component from the first source charge, that hasn't changed. What direction is the... See now, our hat's in this direction, but we have a negative charge, so the field will be towards the field component. And let's, when we add those two field components together, since the distances are the same, the magnitudes of the charges are the same, the electric field at that point would be down. What's that? If we drop the positive test charge in there, it's just subtract the model the electric field, right? If we put in a positive test charge we, there, right, right here, it would go downwards, right? The force on it would be straight down. Yeah. However, as soon as it left that center point, wouldn't it just curve towards the negative charge? What? Yes. The, the field. The, so the question is, it starts to move in this direction and now gets to this point right here. Is the field still straight down? No, now it's closer to the negative charge than the positive charge. So there is now a component of the field in the um, negative x direction. So the <coughs> motion of that charge will start to curve. So that's a good point. We're only talking about points on the x-axis. But again, by symmetry, we would not have to worry about the x components of those two fields. We could just find the y components and say by symmetry so these x components along the x axis. Alright, now let's come back to this question. Start with the rod. We're going to have the same rod we had before. <coughs> if this were a number of source charges, I could start now. Instead of adding each incremental part field, so add the field that instead of adding, what are we going to do now? <coughs> so 
So, our charge density is 4 coulombs per meter. If we have 1 meter, 1 meter times 4 coulombs per meter is 4 coulombs. 2 meters times 4 coulombs per meter. We'd say the charge there is lambda times 2 meters. Again, our charge is equal to our charge density times our deal with that infinite number of charges. Why is it negative L over 2 to L over 2? Why isn't it L? It's L. The length of the rod is L. The way I've drawn the x-axis through here is uh, right through the middle of it, so I get a little bit of symmetry. I guess I started at the bottom on this one. So, actually, I'm going to I'm going to apologize. I'm going to start over and do it with my notes. It's minus L over 2 here to positive L over 2. I'm going to start with this part here with Q equals lambda <coughs> dQ equals lambda dy. And I'm going to look at the field on a point at the x. Somewhere on the next axis. What is R now? My coordinate here is, what's the coordinate of this point here? It's 0 in the x direction and y, where y is equal to negative L over 2. What is this distance R? Let's call this x 0. <coughs> What's this length here? Y. y. What's this length here? X. So R is equal to? distance x, right? And we go up a distance um, in this case negative y, right? So y is negative L over 2 and we're going up a negative y. If y were negative 5, isn't the X Y component of R negative Y. So now we can find R hat equals R vector over R magnitude. The electric field now will be equal to K times Q times R hat divided by R squared. Where did I get the 3 over 2 at the bottom? Go ahead and do intermediate step. Our electric field for the incremental dE will be K times Q. What's Q? Q will be equal to lambda dy times I want to put that back. <coughs> lambda dy. And what is actually R hat. R hat will be equal to. 
to And instead of writing the square root, I'll write 2 1 half. All divided by r squared, which is equal to x squared plus y squared, 2 over 2. We could just say x squared plus y squared, but we can also raise it to the first power. 2 over 2 is a very Now, this can go to the back, where it belongs. We have this quantity to the 2 over 2 times that quantity to the 1 half. That gives you that quantity to the 3 over 2. <coughs> now, we can integrate from negative L over 2 to L over 2. But there's one thing we can do to really simplify our life first. to the y components here? They went away. Isn't there a component here that looks just like this? And inside that, isn't there another component? What's going to happen to the vertical component of the field at this point here? It'll be zero. So we can say by symmetry, we know that this j component is going to go away. And we can take it away. That simplifies our math. We integrate that, but we say by symmetry we can take this part away. This is pretty cool. Now found the field from an infinite number of source <coughs> charges. Now I've got some good news and, and some bad news. The bad news is we'll, we'll, I do want you to go through a couple of these examples and I want you to solve them as you go through the integration. The good news is there's another way to solve these problems. It doesn't require the calculus. It's called Gauss, Gauss's law. It will tell, require that we're going to introduce this new way of looking at fields called field lines. It will require this idea of flux, but it does get rid of a lot of the calculus. So turn it out. So there is another way to approach these types of problems where we have seven. How many people feel absolutely comfortable with this? Okay, a couple. <coughs> How many people feel like this is manageable with a little bit, little bit of work and practice? And how many feel like this is just crazy? If you're in the just crazy, please come stop by me and, and we'll work on it. I don't want to spend a lot of time doing algebra. We can do the same thing with a surface. And what we get is we can find fields for different surfaces. With a dipole, <coughs> along the axis of the dipole, the electric field, so it's very important to see on the axis. The electric field is the dipole moment, which is equal to the charge Q. To calculate the dipole moment, it is a vector. We have negative Q, positive Q. We have some vector S from the negative to the positive. Our dipole moment is equal to Q times S. That equation, so long this 
axis, the field is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught k times 2 times the dipole moment over r what? So if you double the distance from a dipole, what happens to the field strength? One eighth. It drops off a lot faster than a charge. Does that make sense? Why would the field drop a lot faster as you move away from a dipole? Because what? The charges begin to cancel, right? We have a positive and negative charge. As you get farther and farther away, you see a net charge of zero and the relative distance between those is very small. If you look along the axis, so that's the field along this axis. If you look at the bisecting axis, the one we were looking at earlier, the field strength is half as big and then the, the two goes away. The field still drops away as one over r cubed. So field strength from dipoles drop. When we polarize an object, we have a neutral object that's polarized because we bring a charged object next to it. All the atoms form a bipole, dipoles. What do we know about the strength of dipoles? They drop off very quickly. So the, the attraction, the force of attraction between a charged <coughs> object and a neutral object tends to be fairly weak. That's why on those problems we saw for the homework, neutral, positive, neutral to negative. If we have a plane, an infinite, to me, where's the infinite plane? If we have an infinitely large plane, the electric field just goes straight up from the plane or just straight down from the plane. It's kind of like gravity, it's uniform. And it's the plate charge density, the surface charge, divided by 2 epsilon naught. And that field's always perpendicular. How many per infinitely large planes have you guys seen lately? Zero. <laughs> yeah. There's not a whole lot of them. Now, is the Earth flat? No. No, we got over that a little bit ago. <laughs> but we treat the Earth as being flat for our kinematics, didn't we, and our mechanics? Because relative to the problems we're working at, the Earth is relatively flat. In a similar way, if we have a plate and we're relatively close to that plate and the edges are far away, we can treat that plate as being infinitely large. For, there's times where if you have a charged cell, that that can be charged as an infinitely large plate as long as you're close enough to the plate. So again, models are lies, but they're very, very useful. Um, if we have a wire, so this looks a lot like a long, long rod. So if this is our infinitely long rod, that means we're very close relative to its length. The electric field points out radially from that wire, and this field strength can be calculated. We will derive those formula through a variety of methods. But I want us to know them here in the table. And I'm going to have to stop here.